Yes, so hi, what nice to meet you. I'm Jan. I'm working in Berlin in the pharmaceutical headquarter as an agile coach. So working on the topic of agility in the marketing environment, uh, currently in a program where we do the digital transformation of our marketing activities. And I joined by uh, about two years ago um, in July 2020. And prior to that, I have a long history as external consultant working in many different buyer projects uh, from IT end user trainings to project management and so on. And also did some international travel. And I didn't end up where you're working, but at least I made it to the Bristol office. Yeah, indeed. And then, okay, perfect. Thank you for your introduction. Um, I told you we're the most experienced one. But uh, I'm working now for four years uh, in Bayer. Uh, I'm process and quality engineer in Antwerp, which means we look for process improvements. And I'm also responsible for the quality management system. And as I said, uh, four years, I started right out of college. I graduated as chemical engineer and eager to develop myself within within Bayer. Nice. Uh, so maybe you're also, in, on, on, on some parts, you're more experienced than me because I, I did a study to become key, uh, a teacher for chemistry and geography. Never finished that study, just dropped it at some point in time and then became a freelance IT trainer. So when we look at it very formal, you might be more experienced than I am. <laughs> nice. Are you still interested in teaching and those kinds of things? Definitely, yes. So th there are two things I enjoy a lot. The one is sharing of knowledge and the other hand is working with people. But to be honest, I'm very happy that I don't work with kids, but with adults. Uh, sometimes it's very close when you look at our colleagues, uh, mm -hmm. but usually it's it's more professional. It's more content driven. That That's the part that really fascinates me to to look at what to teach and w what is the essence that really matters to people because uh, I think you also have been through some to some trainings and uh, you can do the very technical click through trainings and you just learn where to click when like you could look it up on, on Google or any other search engine. But I think in the end, you you keep nothing in your mind. And what, what really attracts me is then really finding a story to tell. Because nobody cares if you, for example, look at Outlook or look at Excel, how it's really working in the end. But as long as you tell a story to the people, what might have been the idea of the of the programmer of it, then they understand what they're doing. And then you find also the things you need later on by yourself. And then it sticks to their minds. Yeah, because you, you understand it, you can just link it to any knowledge you have instead of there is a button to click. Yeah. I, I also drawn towards teaching. Um, I also got the opportunity via Bayer to give a guest lecture at high school here in Belgium. It was in collaboration with Essentia, who's the overarching uh, institute for chemical uh, and biochemical industry here in Belgium. And I gave a guest lecture to 42 uh, students of 13 years old. So that was quite a challenge, but really rewarding to do and share not only knowledge, but uh, the main focus area was why is STEM, which stands for science, technology, engineering and mathematics. Why is it important and how can we contribute um, towards a better and more sustainable world, for example. And yeah, let's say how nervous have you been prior to the lecture, just switching sides from being a student to becoming a teacher? Yeah, it, the nerves were there. It's quite difficult to not bore young young children uh, for two hours. But we had we had the support of Essentia as said. We got a lecture on how to lecture. We got some practical tests that we could perform and that way we could make it interactive and do tests interact with the children make them do physical fun fun things uh, for example the test i performed uh, was with water and a ping pong ball if you put a ping pong ball in a in a glass of yeah not glass but in a cup of water and you let it drop to the ground then the ping pong ball shoots up. 
and that's purely physical, but it's it quite interests the the young mind. And what what was your personal takeaway from the lecture you did? Mm. That that's a that's a good question. I was quite quite astonished about how much the the young people know about the world problems. Uh, that was also a question to make it interactive. What are uh, according to you the main problems or challenges that we stand for? And then the fossil fuels came out. Uh, the healthcare with yeah, Corona, the COVID crisis. Uh, those, those kind of things, the plastic soup, they all know know those those buzzwords and those challenges. And I think in my time it was not yet so developed. I, I can say that definitely for me as well. And also I think that that's something that makes it quite nice to work at Bayer because that helps you to um, to identify with your employer because A, I must say, there is hardly any company who really has a strong vision statement. And I must say the vision statement of Bayer is a strong one. Just having six words for covering both the, uh, the healthcare section and the crop science section with hunger for none, health for all. And I think that's a very strong one. And that's also something that that motivates a daily work and something we have seen one or two months ago when we had a guided tour at the Berlin site and we got some insights on what are we producing in the pharmaceutical business and what diseases we are tackling and what is the effort and then what is the impact of the effort you're doing. That that was really helping you because sometimes in the in the marketing world you're far away from having an impact. Uh, maybe in the chemistry area you're even closer. You just see it on the paper, but you have an imagination on what is it doing in real life. And in marketing, it's sometimes a little bit difficult. And if you just get back to to that healthcare uh, and all the other aspects, I think that's really helpful. And in, in addition to that, because that that is what is just close to our business. Where I also see a lot of change is um, on the environmental goals we are setting up ourselves, but even more on the cultural goals. And with Serena as the one accountable for change management and the culture in our company, I think there is a lot of things happening at the moment. And to be very honest, we are from the traditional, a German corporate based uh, company in a lot of parts. We are pharmaceutical business driven. We love processes. We, we don't love change so much. Mm. And what, what, what I've seen in the last two, three years is that this company really opened up to, to get into different ways of leading, to change the culture, to, to get into real empowerment and realizing that empowering your employees and empowering your team does not mean to delegate tasks but to share problems and ask them for solutions. I think here in Antwerp we are a former Monsanto site uh, so that was American based uh, an American based company and here the change was quite the opposite so it was our people here felt really in empowered then and that was a bit looking for the best way how to interact with buyer in which they have sometimes strict policies but i think buyer is really taking the opportunity to merge the two cultures the american with the strict german one let's say into one overarching culture then yeah, we had a nice experience in the last two years. We had two colleagues from the US, uh, from Missouri, who joined our team as Agile coach. And agility was much more developed in the legacy Monsanto business. And so they were far ahead of us. And then we took them in an assignment. So they joined our team for a year to share the knowledge, to help us to speed up. And that was quite a uh, steep learning curve for us because there was so much knowledge and there was so much hands-on mentality where when you're open to it you can really take a lot of it out of it but as we were working in a program and there were not only the HR coaches who were really open to apply to that change but there were also the people uh, who work with buyer for decades so sometimes it was a little bit of the feeling we were in the middle between keeping the agile coach from the US back to not run in the front too far away 
And with the other arm grabbing to the other side, the colleagues from the program that we somehow keep the connect. And that was really challenging, but it was a nice experience because it was helping us in our role to develop and, and then being, let's say, the translator for the rest of the business to put it into a more European or German style to more relaxed change management. I need to see your current job. Um, you are an agile coach. And does that mean that you try to help people, uh, colleagues, employers of buyer to cope with change? Or how does that work? It, it's uh, about helping them to cope with change, but also supporting them and understanding what is the added value for it. So what's in it for me and even more working with teams and with wor working with leadership on how we really can create value. And the nice thing is, at least for the pharmaceutical business, uh, we are starting. So we are maybe a little bit late to the train of agility, but for us in our role, it's quite nice because we can really shape what agility means to us and how do we want to live it. And the major piece is to become data driven. And we don't want to be data driven in the way like Facebook, Amazon, Google do it, but we want to be data driven in the way that we really understand the needs of our customers, that we understand what does a patient need or what does an HCP, so a healthcare professional, a doctor, a pharmacist, uh, will need from us. Because at the moment we are creating a lot of data, but it's mainly internal data. So we, we produce it by ourselves and it's, it's from the internal world and it's not verified with the external world. And that is where we need to go. We really need to see what is adding value, where we should we invest our resources in to really produce in value and then making our vision or the, the pharmaceutical part health for all real. Yeah. And to get there, it's it's about talking to leadership and making leadership understanding what, what modern leadership means in terms of empowerment, supporting teams, protecting teams, and maybe the most important piece in this corporation prioritizing what really matters and don't work on 10 things at the same time, but finish one thing first and then go to the second. Hmm. On the other hand, um, it's also then about talking with the teams and asking the teams, what do you need and what is a blocker in your way? And then supporting them in, in solving that blocker or just taking the topic up if it's outside of their area of accountability and then seeing with the leadership team or with other stakeholders, how we can make their life smoother, that we can really process faster. And, and maybe the, the last bit, it's then something we call the HL onion. And uh, like an onion, you have from the inside to the outside, it's growing. And in the inside, you have like the very technical things like tools, processes. You maybe have heard of Jira or some other tools, a Kanban board where you can just visualize your work. And I can put my work in there if I believe in it or not, but I can do it. Also, I can follow a process somebody explained to me, no matter if I believe in, uh, if you don't believe in uh, your yearly taxation, uh, you can still make the tax declaration. That's not too hard. But then there are the invisible pieces to, to adapt to the values and to the principles behind. So really trust your colleagues speak up openly, uh, share mistakes and learn from them and have trustful, open conversations. And then you get into something which is then the bigger piece on the outside that covers the onion. And that is the HR mindset. And our idea is to bring people to that. But that probably takes some years and you just start in the middle with the processes, easy to see. Yeah. And then we still need to work until it really becomes a habit. Indeed. And what I quite find quite interesting quite interesting about working for buyer is yeah the the diversity of the work areas we have yeah the healthcare section where you are or uh, yeah where you are working the pharma division um, i started in crop science and when i began working here i i knew buyer was bigger than only and the factory in Antwerp, but I am really drawn towards the vision, health for all, hunger for none, because it's also bigger than only crop science. It's also helping ill people. I do not have the have impact on, on that directly, um, but it's nice to see that I work for a company for which that is important. And in saying that the part of, yeah, uh, 
fighting hunger and uh, providing food to people is, I would say, equally important. Uh, so, yeah, it, it's really helpful. And there are so many companies uh, out there, I would say, I couldn't work for them because I, I'm not buying into the business model. And mm. I think that's different. And uh, is that something that is captured or is supported by Bayer that you are now working for Pharma? But an agile coach for pharma will probably have the same uh, struggles as an agile coach in consumer health or crop science. Is there cross uh, cross learning there? Uh, definitely. So we we have communities. Uh, so there is an agile community um, where we exchange with agile uh, coaches, with scrum masters of different roles, also with change uh, experts from different countries, from different regions, from different um, divisions. So pharma, uh, consumer health, crop science, to just learn from each other and to not make the same mistakes again. And also just use what is there because another big benefit is don't invent the wheel new all the time, but steal with pride. If something worked, just take it and use it again. And maybe you can even improve it a little bit and share it back. And that's, that's better than working in an island. I would yeah, say yeah. indeed. In in the Benelux, they've rolled out the YAP, which stands for Young Advisory Board Bayer Benelux. It's also something I am part of, and it started one year ago. And it's really young people around the divisions, uh, around the different locations that are brought together, and which get in contact with the country leadership team. We work on different projects, but can also give our input on topics. And that's that really opened my world towards the different divisions and that Bayer is doing more than only focusing on one key area. Are you aware of Young Bayer? Yes, yes, indeed. Yeah. That's also, yeah, that's a, a global group then for where young Bayer employees can interact. And, and there are also work streams there working on, if I'm correct, yeah, inclusion and diversity, also sustainability. Uh, so that's something which I see as next step after the YAP Benelux, let's say. Yeah. And then uh, I also learned, uh, you, you or I hope it's, it's the same for all employee resource group. I can say that for Blend, the Bayer LGBT network, it is the same as for Young Bayer. You you can invest as much time as you like to. So you can hop on, hop off. Uh, you can uh, just read the news without interacting because I think like everybody just being part of it is, is an added value. And then in Berlin, they just created um, a web application on the intranet where you could see what is the current energy consumption. And it was launched, I think, in, in spring, something like February or so. So you can see for the main building in Berlin, where most employees are sitting, um, how much energy do we consume uh, in the night? So what's the baseline? And then how much is added then during the day, hour by hour? And that, that's quite interesting. And that also then it, the trigger to think about how much energy are we using and what really drives me mad when you see all the colleagues just leaving uh, the offices open doors light on and so on and i think it's it's more relevant at the moment than it has been before when the tool launched yeah indeed and that's correct and with the blend network so the lgbt group we did a nice activity together with young buyer in may we had the european diversity months so uh, each week was dedicated to one of our uh, employee groups and was blend. We were in the third week because that's also where you have the International Day Against uh, Homophobia. And that's why that was dedicated to the blend chapter. And the week after us, that was the week of Young Bayer. And from blend, we this year gave the organization of our uh, Pride Parade truck participation in Cologne and to Berlin to a students group. So I think it was January or February, we reached out to the dual students in in Berlin and Leverkusen. And we have a, had a small group. And as it's always, if you work half a year on a project, voluntarily, you, you lose some people because they overestimated the time uh, um, commitment they can make. But in the end, we had a group of five students who organized the trucks in Berlin and Cologne. It was their first Pride participation ever because they were uh, not part of the LGBT community. And then we, we took that as a nice 
as a nice hook up to have a discussion in the European Pride Month together with the Young Bayer chapter as we are in the one week, you're in the next week. So let's hand over to you for the next week on what diversity really uh, means to us and uh, if there are any any borders within the company or every boundaries that we see. Um, and that was just the perfect example. That's nice. So you're also in the, let's say, organizing committee of uh, the blend community. Is that correct? I, I don't have a formal role, but I'm one of the, I would say, the, the active members in, in Berlin, where we are a group of three, four people who mainly drive it. And then I'm interacting a lot with the colleagues from Leverkusen and Wuppertal. Uh, and sometimes also on the global level. Yeah. yeah, nice. That's nice. Yeah, I I discovered Young Buyer around a year ago, and initially, or it still strikes to me as a bit as a pharma stronghold. Let's say uh, it's mainly focused on on pharma, but I hope I can I can give my input from a crop science point of view. But as you said, everybody is free to invest as much or as less time as they want. So I think that's, that's really nice. I also know a colleague from who he, uh, moved to Poland who's enabling functions. So the ones supporting our business outside of the three divisions we have. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, he, he's supporting it uh, from, from enabling functions, even being in, in none of the three areas. But I also know um, two colleagues who are very strongly involved in that, and they are both from the pharmaceutical division in Berlin. And yeah, then you always get your peers around you, but I'm quite sure they are open for everybody to support. And it, it's the same in Berlin with Blend. If you just have a few active people and then these active people recruit a little bit more, then you get a community in one area. And sometimes you just need to look at it from an outside perspective and say, well, we need to be more diverse, maybe. But that's the that's the beauty of those resource groups. I found it good that it was shared on the intranet to all employees that they exist and everybody is free to share and that's uh, to everybody is free to join. And that's also inclusion and diversity, I think. Yeah, and, and what I see is that um, also there we are breaking up the, we could call it silos, even I don't want to call it really silos, but you know, uh, we all have our focus. There is the Enable group for people with disabilities. There's Young Buyer for the younger uh, generation. There's Plan for LGBT. There is Grow for the women who are always including all the allies they have who want to support their mission. And what I really see is that diversity is becoming an, an overarching theme. And it's not about uh, we're working on disabilities, we are working on LGBT rights, we are working on listening to young people. But for example, at the Pride in Cologne, uh, not in Cologne in Berlin, we organized a podest for people, for example, sitting in wheelchairs that in front of the stage, they can have a view around what's happening. And, and that was quite nice because we really say, well, it's, it's about diversity and inclusion. And so if we go to an LGBT event, it's not about LGBT rights only, but it's also about how to make people from the community with disabilities really enjoying that moment. And as we had it with Young Bayer also going in there and Young Bayer having that um, that parts where the work on diversity topics and, and then really joined forces and also seeing that across the divisional people that we have. Uh, I closely work with the ones responsible for IND in, in, in Germany in the pharmaceutical business. And th there is a lot of exchange and it's not about What's my topic? What's yours? It's really about where can we create an impact? Young Bayer is, uh, by the way, mer uh, yeah, merging uh, and it will become Merge, uh, which is for yeah, the multi-generational uh, resource group. So it's not purely focused on the young employees then, uh, but really taking into account all different generations. Maybe looking to what what you said in the beginning, like you you're interested in, in self development. What what is the thing that that really attracts you in in your personal career, and what do you see as as the next step, or maybe as the thing where you say, well, then that, that, that's really fascinating. I want to dive in there. Yeah, I always want to challenge myself. Uh, that's quite important. 
I started fresh out of college. So everyone, every bit of working in a company like Bayer was quite new to me. But then I started growing, getting used to the job content, looking at the processes. Then after one and a half year, I got the opportunity to become the quality engineer. So becoming responsible for the quality systems. Um, of course, that's also a learning curve. And then there's a bit less time for the process side. But then I started developing myself as quality engineer, picked back up the yeah, picked back the work as process engineer. And last year I worked on a project. So I started the project management train a bit, starting small with as project manager for a small project. And currently I'm working on a bigger project uh, supporting the engineering department. So that's really, I find it really interesting to yeah, develop myself, getting new challenges, getting new impulses. And what I'm eager for or what I'm looking forward is to transition into a leadership role. So leading people, creating one team, and that's also something I get supported by. I did already some trainings, but that's something I am I look forward to in the future. Nice, uh, and I think that that's really important. And I'm I'm really lucky with my manager as well because she's very very much people focused, and she's really dedicating time. Even she has a large team in having not only check-ins on your on your goals, but also having a proper development dialogue on where you're standing, where do you want to work on yourself, and, and what's your plan forward, and and not going in there with, with a fixed way proposing, but more asking the questions and then letting you develop your way, but but challenging you on what you really want to achieve and what it might look like and where do you see yourself in a few years. And that that's not a given, I would say, for each and every manager. And if you, if you also have that experience, I think that that's great. Yeah, I think one one thing that strikes me, or what also was told when I was hired by uh, Bayer, was you are in the driver's seat. You, of course, you get support by your manager, but you are in the driver's seat, and you need to yeah see the opportunities when they come, and yeah. when they come, you have to take them with your your both hands and you, I experienced it myself sometimes you you have to choose if you choose one thing you lose a bit of the other thing but it's a win win lose you win some you lose some and it's something you have to determine by yourself or, or sometimes you you feel you're losing something because you don't know yet what you're winning Yesterday, I, I saw yeah. a nice cartoon uh, on the intranet um, where the heart was really sad because it was about a book and the chapter or the book was finished. And then the heart was really overreacting on it, like it's over and everything I'm losing. And then mm -hmm. there was the next book and then it was like a new story, new characters, uh, new adventures. And maybe I've been overreacting. There is a new opportunity. And then diving in there and then sometimes it's like that you you don't know yet what what's coming up are you aware of the mentoring program options and of go learn it by uh, yes yes so that's also quite interesting yeah through the yap as i told the young advisory board where we got a mentor from the country leadership team mm -hmm. and that's also very interesting as is this talk uh, talking to someone completely different in the company It's also a mentor program where you can exchange, learn, get new insights from a senior leader. And in that case, so those opportunities are there, but you have to take them by yourself. You have to seize the opportunity to participate in those programs. And maybe also uh, as an advice from my side, when you're in a mentoring session, I think our, our leaders are getting open for having a both or be directional mentorship it, it's not about only learning from them but it's also of, of sharing back because the world is changing very quickly and dramatically and what was right uh, 10 years ago isn't right today and especially from the program i'm working in when it, 
it comes to interacting with our customers. A doctor is not working the same way um, as he has he did it three years ago. I see it with my own doctor who has the options of doing video calls with him and all, all the thing. I, I can fully book everything online. I only get in touch with him for a video call on time. And we need to learn that. I think that that's something where senior leadership, and I would say also I already uh, could learn from young people a, a lot of things because the mindset is a different one and it's more openness to technology. And sometimes I think you just need to be brave and stand up and uh, also tell a senior leader how to do things differently. And a, a colleague of mine asked that in a town hall meeting. So I know it was not a question that was prepared in the beginning because a colleague of mine just posted it during the meeting asking our farmer senior leadership team, so the ex, uh, executive committee, what they do differently. And one of the executive team members just said, look, um, who knows me? I'm, I'm not a digital expert. So what did I do in that time? Uh, I just took online courses on data science and everything related to that because it's so important. I need to understand that to perform in my role. And then when I dived into that, I looked up for reverse mentoring from learning from the expert in our company, what that really means to me. And and that was really showing that some uh, and hopefully many of our senior leaders are very, very open to learn, to adapt. And that we realized if we want to do a successful business, we need to learn every day. That's true. Uh, I, I also have an example in my mind. Uh, it was a kind of TED talk organized by Jong Bayer then with Heiko Schipper, he's the yeah. CFO, I think. He's the and it was also consumer health, right? Yeah, uh, I think so. Yeah. And it was also a question raised by the audience. Why aren't we sharing our failures more? Because we share our successes. That's great. But you often learn the most from your failures. And then he was really open and he shared one of his failures, it was about a product going to the market somewhere. And then afterwards, like one or two months after that, I also saw an article on Bayernet where they mentioned it's not wrong to share failures. It's something we, we learn from. So that's really nice that input is or questions are asked and that senior leaders also do something with it. And it's so important that it's supported by the senior leadership because otherwise nobody will speak up. And I also had that experience when I was still an external contractor to Bayer and I was working on a, a compliance report. So, so looking up some assets and then getting to a very long Excel list. So we had like, I don't know, 1600 entries in and then like 25 different categories. And then I worked on Excel formulas on telling you like, if that is combination, then you're compliant or you're not compliant. And I messed up a formula. And then I sent out the reports to the asset owner saying you're compliant or you're not compliant. And one of them got a false negative alert. And she was just sitting next to the manager who was accountable for that. And then she, she was looking at the email in the meeting, was pointing out to him, you need to explain that to me, like saying you're, you're not uh, compliant because of no reasons. And then, of course, he called me. I was in the middle of a meeting and then it got quite stressful and then I figured it out. And luckily, it was just like three or four uh, assets that were wrongly uh, mentioned. But for him, it was totally OK, because like we're human beings, we do mistakes. But the most important thing is if you realize there is a mistake, be transparent with it and share it openly. And then we can, can mitigate it and we can work on it and we can turn around to be on the safe side again. If you hide it, then usually the problem gets worse. So if, if the leadership is not promoting a failure culture, people will hide that. And then the problem will become bigger because you don't realize it. You still continue with that mistake. And I think then then it's really a problem. So th that was a really nice experience for me. And also to the colleague afterwards, I wrote an email saying, OK, thank you for highlighting. I'm sorry for for um, putting you on alert. And her answer was very shortly, well, I think you owe me a beer. <laughs> and then you got hired by Bayer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was two or three years later. But then they they offered me the contract to become the HR coach. That was quite nice. Yeah. Anything else on your mind to discuss? Yeah, I find the different 
perspectives again really interesting i think we are quite we quite have different content or uh, or job content you ask me the question where do yeah, i see myself i will revert the question where do you see yourself within yeah, let's say two three four five years that's a real difficult question for me, honestly. And I just had that in my development dialogue with my manager because I'm I'm not such a big fan of planning. And, and until now, I had a career by accident. There were always an opportunity which I took and it worked out very well. And uh, yeah, now being part of the corporate world, um, you, you need to find your way. And I think for the next two, three years, I still see me in the role as an agile coach because there, there is so much you can shape within this organization, and especially with pharmaceuticals just being at the beginning of really becoming agile and also seeing that agility is in every changes we're doing at the moment. If we look at our culture changes, as we look at how we transform it placed in the pharmaceutical business, how we run our business, how we set up our teams and our functions. There's a little bit of agility in all of it, and, and mostly it's it's large bit of agility, sometimes called like that, and sometimes you just see, well, it's, it's called differently, but the principles, the values are the same, and I believe it's really beneficial for the company. And last but not least, working in, in a great team, because uh, our team completely formed in the pandemic time, uh, so we hardly see on time, uh, on-site, but we managed from the first day to work in a team full of trust, openness, where you really not only share challenges, but where you also share tensions that were there between two team members. Even they were solved, you retrospectively share them. Like in case you have noticed that there were some tensions, we discussed that it's all fine, don't worry about. And that's that's why I feel really happy in, in the area I'm in at the moment with the team, with the management. Yeah. And then going on, I think the most important thing for me is to to work with people and to to be in contact and to be a little bit of an organizer and let's see what what's coming up from there. I, I maybe the job uh, that's next is not yet named the role, but I think uh, keeping it up with agility and really seeing where the value lies and making value real for the company, for the patients, uh, for the doctors. I think that that's close to my heart and nice. And you mentioned the whole agility team where you are, you are part of formed during the pandemic. Have you already met your team members in person then now? Yeah, l luckily um, all of them. So all of the ones in my team are Berlin based. So sometimes we meet in the office. We also have the opportunity to sometimes go for uh, an after work event. So just share a glass of wine, a beer, some food. And, and that's really helpful in, in building up the connections. We, we are closely connected to the learning team where people are more distributed to, to the Cologne area, but also to Spain. And you hardly see them. And you always see when, when people meet together the first time, it completely turns around how people collaborate with each other. And, and the level of trust and openness. And it's it's not about that you're mistrusting the others if you haven't met them. Uh, it's more like a neutral face. You don't know if you can trust them. And that can quickly, very quickly be turned around. Yeah. We also went for, a, for an after drink, like a summer bar with the whole team. Uh, and that's a nice way of getting to know each other even better uh, after so many years, but in an informal way. And it, it's the small things that, that really leave an impression for a long time. I remember I was meeting a colleague at a winery and I know the owner of the shop. So when he was closing the shop down, we were still sitting outside and he were like, OK, I'm closing. And we were like, OK, bottle is empty. We, we will leave. And then like, you can have another one. Uh, so if you finish it, just put the glasses and the bushes on the other side of the street. I will take them out tomorrow morning. So it was locking the chairs and the tables already. We still... Uh, kept the seat in there we ordered a new bottle of wine and so we are sitting outside the closed winery and then we ordered some food the delivery guy was very happy because it was like 32 degrees and he was arriving we were sitting on the street saying like, here and he was like oh i don't need to go to the back house to the fifth floor so he was happy as well but he delivered food without cutlery and i had a caesar salad and my colleague she had a quinoa salad <laughs> and then we were sitting outside of the winery 
and eating quinoa and Caesar salad with our fingers instead of cutlery. And that, that are the moments that really stick to your mind, that really create a, a strong boundary, or if you just go to a picnic or something, the less perfect it is, the more the team grows together. That's true. That's true. And how does it work with the new ways of working? It's another buzzword. The home office policy in the Benelux, it was rolled out. It was a new policy. How does it work in, in Germany uh, for your team then particularly? I must say I was surprised how modern we are at, with this uh, policy. The German policy is, and that's fully approved with the Workers' Council and all the legal regulations we need. You can work from wherever you would like to. The only thing which is not wanted is working 100% remotely. And 100% remotely does not mean you need to come every week. But depending on your location, on your task, how the team setup is, at least sometimes you should be in the office meeting your colleagues. From Germany, we can work from every place we want for. So I could go to the Baltic Sea, work from there. Still, of course, need to work. Maybe the beach wouldn't be a proper place, but an apartment and then after work going to the beach. Mm. Um, just if there is any reason, you need to be in the office the next day, which I think is completely fair. So if my computer breaks, I'm at the sea, I say, well, I cannot work. Uh, I think it's okay to uh, to think that I should be in the office then the next day to get it fixed. So that's my own risk. And we could even work for a few days um, remotely from other parts of the European Union. Okay. Cool. And then I know other uh, pharmaceutical companies who really have stricter regulations, like one friend told me, the team needs to set up two fixed days per week. So the team decides on two weekdays where they have to be in the office. And then there is a third day where you must come in, but you can choose it flexible. So if there is a bank holiday in a week, you can only work from home at uh, not more than one day. I think there, there we are much more flexible and we just decide uh, spontaneously with our teams. When do we meet on site to get together? Some teams have fixed days depending on how they collaborate, but but that's really up to the team. So it really adds value instead of having a fixed policy um, to, to have it equally for everybody. How is it in the Benelux? Uh, in the Benelux, it was a bit more strict. So there were choices for like 40% office, 60%, 80% or 100%. Of course, it's also depending on what role you are in. Um, an operator who operates the, uh, the, the factory or the production location, it's difficult for him to work at home. So right. he's location-based for my team i'm a process engineer we we can choose one or two days a week i do not need it i like going to work and it's nice that there are also colleagues there and that you can interact and create value that way and because i i find find it more difficult via teams but as you said there are others in Deem, for example who decide as a team to be a bit more flexible but it's uh, it's being evaluated and my perspective is that it will become more flexible and give more ownership to the to the teams yeah and i think that that's also changing the way we are, we are collaborating and uh, in berlin we we started to refurbish the first three floors in the main building and next week i will have a guided tour in there to make it more open. So there, there will be still regular offices with two or three desks in, but there is also like open space where you can just sit and discuss among other colleagues. And I, I see that as a big benefit because the program I'm currently working in, we started in an external office place. So we rented offices um, in an external location and then everybody from the project was asked to be there two and a half fixed days a week. And it was so differently because we had people from brand teams. We had people from brand agnostic teams. We had people from IT. We had support from medical functions and so on. And usually in the Berlin side, you sit spread quite away from each other. Sometimes you just need to calculate 10 minutes, 15 minutes of walking to get from one place to the other. And so we just had three offices with, uh, with a table for 10, 12 people in each office. And people were just sitting there and working on. And instead of scheduling a meeting, you were just grabbing the colleague and discussing it. 
and it was so much solution oriented it was all all the background that you have which team am i belonging to what's my function was moving more to the background because you were not sitting in your office with your peers and then somebody from another function came to your office room uh, uh, as a visitor and and that changed how you how you see problems and it really brings you to that solution oriented moment and I'm quite curious how it will be in the in the pilot we we have ready now, and two more floors are coming until the end of the year. And I hope that will give us also a little bit of a booster to really be solution oriented, value outcome oriented, instead of just keeping functions busy. And how are those changes monitored throughout the organization? Because most of the time, yeah, when there comes an ID from above, if it seeps through and then sometimes the troubles are with the people who do the daily work i'm thinking about the transformation of procurement for example that's a big pain in the ass let's say for antwerp because we sometimes we need to have a quick quick option to buy something but with the current procurement organization that's not always possible and in the beginning, it, it was quite difficult. We had to get yeah um, the the back doors uh, to get some things just done and to keep the facility running. Is that I, something where you, with the office change, also take accountability, or how does that work? Personally, I don't think that the the different office setup will have a huge risk of blocking any business. Um, so. There are a lot of colleagues who have concerns. The concerns are like, if we have less desks in the office, what is if all desks are fully booked and how do I get there? What if, if we have too many people in the office? To be honest, at the moment, we don't have any restrictions to go to the office. And when you look around, it's less people than prior. And it's maybe half of the people. So if there is maybe a big workshop, it will get more crowded. But usually then these people will also sit in a workshop room and not on the floor where you're working. And honestly, I think that that will level out. And there might be one, two days a year where it's more difficult, but we will cope with that. And from my personality, I would just say, let's experience it. Let's see what the real challenges are and not the ones I might foresee and then tackle them when they are there. Uh, because I think like 90, 95% of the issues people see will not appear. And yes, you you have to work on what you have at your desk. If you just have a little locker and you don't have a cupboard and a container and a drawer and everything, but also like most papers, you can give away. And for the other ones, we will find solutions. And one thing I just learned because the blend LGBT community at Bayer, we were also asked by the new office concept for Leverkusen, what would be our input? So they reached out to all employee resource group asking like, if we transform our offices, what would you like to get with the transformation? And I had a chat with a person from that project team and she told me that even the the CEO offices, so all the C-level offices in Leverkusen, they also changed to an open space concept, giving up their own offices. Of course, I would say it's still different from what we get, at, at, at least from the accessibility. I don't imagine everybody can go there and just sit uh, next to Werner Baumann and then trying to work from there. But also they gave up their, their individual cubicles, let's say, the, the uh, huge rooms with the separate op, uh, office desk, with the separate meeting uh, desk and so on. And if they really lift that out, I think that they are really good in role modeling. And that would also take away a lot of of arguments from people saying, I need to have my own office. I need to close the door. Everything I'm doing is so restricted. I, every day, every time I only have calls where I have so confidential information. If also our C-level can work in an open space, the most likely you can also manage that. There, there will be HR topics, but there will be still meeting rooms available. And then you just book a meeting room. Yeah. I'm currently sitting in a small area uh, where it's closed off, but we also have a, an open space office. It's really nice to get a fast interaction with the colleagues. Um, but if we want, we can separate ourselves and close the door, let's say. How is it in, uh, in making up connections? Uh, so if you're four years with Bayer, I would say like more than half of the time was in the pandemic. And the first year is maybe not the easiest one to build a network. Yeah, my, my first years were 
not in the pandemic, so that was quite nice that I could interact directly with with our colleagues. But I find that fire, especially here in Antwerp or the Benelux, it really has an open-minded culture. My colleague who started working in the pandemic, she really copes well with the all digital. I find it impressive how big her network already is. So whether it's in the pandemic or in real life, you always have the possibility to expand your network, learn new new people, interact with them, either via on project-based opportunities where you need input from a different section of the company or in a more private or personal way of working through outreach programs or uh, sport events. Yeah, I also think so. And even in the pandemic, you have a lot of opportunities by just meeting people, virtual coffees. And I think it's so important. When in my team, we had new hires, we, we always set up a lot of one-on-ones with people from the work area. But we also try to find at least one person from from a different team who have a rough understanding of what that person is doing, but is not connected to us so that a new colleague could go to, let's call it a mentor and say, well, I had an idea and Jan said me that's not making sense. Is it just because Jan has such a closed mindset and he don't wants me to do that? Or is there a reason I don't understand at the moment why that idea is not good? And then you can really go to a person more neutral, not related to your work environment. And I, I find it's quite nicely that often there were kind of mentorships created and close relationship between that people. And that, of course, then broadens also your network and other areas of the company, which you don't get in touch virtually, but then you have the option. So I find it really interesting, Jan. Uh, Thank you for your time. I learned a new uh, aspect of working at Bayer. I also like the fact that you are quite involved in a global resource group. And that's something I also want to discover. So thank you very much. Yeah, and thanks. I also enjoyed the time and would also be great to to stay in contact and have discussions on development and so on furthermore, because also I learn a lot because I'm I'm not so much into all the production pieces and that that's one important part where we create value and helps me a lot. So thanks for all the insights and for, for the openness and sharing the personal experience. Oh.